Hi guys, festivities have begun and it is the season of mists and mellow fruitfulness like John Keats would put it. So it is the season of autumn and festivities and I really hope that you're doing well, that you're happy, you're keeping happy and healthy this season. Now in our video today we're going to start with lyric poetry. So this is a new topic I'm beginning today and the reason why is because we're going to shift to the Roman critics. We've already covered the Greek critics, we've discussed Aristotle, Plato and uh, Socrates in detail, right? We're covering literary criticism. Now we're going to talk about Horace, Longinus and Quintilian. These three are Roman critics which we have to cover. Now Horace is very well known for lyric poetry. So I figured that if you know the history of lyric poetry, its evolution and the characteristics of lyric poetry and the types as well and the definition of course. If you know these things then you know understanding Horace might be a little bit more easier for all of us. So therefore we're going to discuss lyric poetry in detail. Everything from its history, its evolution up until the present day. How do we know lyric uh, today? Like the song lyrics and everything you'll have an idea of it through this video so without any further ado let's get right into it let us try and understand the history of lyric poetry so this is the greek lyric we are not talking about modern day lyric we are talking about the greek lyric where it started where all of this started okay so the body of lyric poetry written in dialects of ancient greece so in ancient greece the language that they used okay the dialects of ancient greece uh, the 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 poems written in those dialects are known as lyrics okay now primarily associated with this early 7th and early 5th centuries, oh sorry, early 7th to the early 5th centuries BC, a period known as the Lyric Age of Greece. Now see, we have so many things, right? We have Golden Age of this, or maybe the Jazz Age. We have different ages, right? We characterize those age by what? By, it can, every age differs from one another because there's a distinguishing feature, right? We distinguish the Elizabethan era from the Victorian era, the Victorian era from the Romantic era. We, we uh, distinguish it because, you know, culture is evolving. Culture is not static. Culture is always evolving. Society is evolving. So, you know, this period from 7th to 5th centuries BC is the uh, period where the lyric actually developed. And that is why it is known as the Lyric Age of Greece. Because the song, the lyric, melic and choric songs, we'll talk about it. The lyric was actually developing and flourishing in this era. And this lyric is not the modern day song lyrics we're talking about or modern day lyric poetry which we're talking about. We have characteristics to this ancient Greek lyric, okay? And we're going to talk about it. So lyric is one of the broad categories of poetry in class classical antiquity. I already talked about classical antiquity when I explained Socrates, right? So we're just going to do a little recap. This classical an antiquity is also known as the classical era or classical period. What is this classical period? Classical period is, it comprises the interwoven civilization no, the, of the Greek, uh, of Greece and Rome. The Greek and Roman civilizations, the interwoven civilizations and the flourishing of these civilizations in the Mediterranean basin, right? That is the classical era when these two civilizations flourished. So these are commonly known as the Greco-Roman Empire, okay, when they were flourishing. So this is the period, the uh, modern day people, they, there's a lot of debate on to when did it start and when did it end but generally it is agreed that it began from the 8th till the 5th centuries BC. So this is the classical era okay. So this is uh, what we have to know. Now you have to know that lyric had developed okay alongside drama and epic. Now you have to understand one thing drama today we know is about dialogues. Epic we know it's about you know heroic deeds it can be a novel as well right but lyric drama and epic these three were all written in verse form drama was also written in verse form now i'll tell you you have to just understand this remember we read the rise of the novel there was this dominance of drama during the elizabethan age people did not write prose they used to write drama right and then a time came when you know there was the rise of the novel and then you have people shifting to prose shifting to writing novels so you see we are evolving day by day. New things are coming up every day. So here too, you have to remember that drama was not always about dialogues. Epic was also not always about, you know, it was not just prose. Epic was about heroic deeds, about supernatural things and everything, okay, about valor and it was about big things, okay, epic. So epic was also written in poetry form, okay, in verse form. Drama too in ancient Greece was written in verse form. And lyric, of course, is written in verse form. We're going to talk about it. So drama and classical antiquity, that is the classical era, 
drama in the classical period in Greece that is uh, both tragedy and comedy was written in verse form that's why we we entered here right the lyric is one of the broad categories of poetry alongside drama and epic the categories of poetry in ancient Greece okay the categories was lyric drama and epic so this was the classification of poetry of ancient Greece Okay, now we have so many others, right, in the modern day, but that time it was these three. Now, epic. Greek epics are a collection of ancient texts that tell the stories of heroes and gods. They were a vital part of classical Greek culture and were performed at festivals and used in schools. So, we all know this. Okay, we're just going to move on further. Much of Greek lyric is occasional poetry. What is occasional poetry? Simply, I'll tell you. Today, you have your friend's birthday and you, you know, with love, you write a very nice, you compose a nice poem for your friend. So, you know, that is occasional poetry. You are actually writing it on a particular occasion. Similarly, it's Independence Day and you write a patriotic poem on that day, right? So, it is in, oh, and on, you know, you're dedicating it to the occasion. So, it's an occasional poetry. Similarly, Greek lyric also is occasional poetry composed for public or private performances by a soloist or chorus to mark particular occasions. Now, soloist, you either go and do it alone, recite it alone or a chorus, that is a group of you go and recite it alone. I mean, recite it together, sorry. So, soloist, okay, now you have to understand, soloist is like, I can come here and I can just sing the song without music, okay, or... I can play the guitar myself and sing. It's a solo performance with music. Or I don't know how to play the, mu uh, the guitar. So I ask someone that you play the guitar and I will sing. So that is also a solo performance. Somebody is playing the music and you're singing. It's a solo song. You're, you are a soloist. So understand, you can come here and actually just sing without music. You can play music yourself and sing. Or you can give the guitar to somebody to play and you sing. Okay, that's a solo performance. Chorus, you have a group of you. Somebody's playing the drums, somebody's playing the pipe, somebody's playing, uh, say, uh, you know, uh, sorry, somebody's playing the flute. I said the pipe, sorry. Somebody played the flute and somebody's playing, you know, these different musical instruments and all of you are singing together. Okay, harmonizing together. That is a chorus. So, you know, you've performed in a group or you've performed in a, so uh, a, a solo. If you are a soloist and you're singing solo, uh, you're singing all these songs solo then you this whole song this category will be known as melic songs okay and if you're singing together in a chorus these are known as choric songs so this is in ancient greece okay lyric was sometimes sung to the accompaniment of either a string instrument particularly the lyre or kithara now i've given the picture over here the one i'm marking now is actually the lyre and the one that i'm marking now is um, uh, the uh, olos so the lyre or the kithara is a stringed instrument and uh, there's a wind instrument like a flute it's a wind instrument most often the reed pipe called olos so i've given the uh, picture over there so you used these two instruments were broadly used generally used when they performed okay so whether the accompaniment was a string or wind instrument the term for such accompanied lyric was melic poetry so you can use a flute and sing you can use the lyre and sing if you're performing solo it is known as melic okay why is it known melic because the greek word for song is melos in, in, in the Greek language, melos means song. So it's melic poetry. And um, of course, chorus, so it's together, right? Uh, uh, the Greek chorus, so it's, uh, you know, choric poetry. So lyric could also be sung without any instrumental accompaniment. So lyric, you have a song. Now you just don't play music. As a chorus also, you don't take instruments and you just sing together. As a soloist also, you don't use any instrument and just sing. But usually, usually the most wide practice was that they used to play the lyre or some kind of musical instrument they used to use and then they used to sing. So this is uh, the Greek lyric. We are going to talk about the distinction between melic and choric songs. So let's get right into that. Now see, melic and choric songs, I've cleared it out for you. So this is just like concrete things. I've given like for clarity, I've given like two pictures over here. One person is using the lyre. You can see that, right? The stringed instrument. And here it's, we, we have written that we are typically, or these words typically sung in a single voice or a soloist using the lyre. Typically, okay. Typically means generally. Now choric songs you see over there, I'll mark over here, you can see a group of people in a circle, right? Or almost like a semicircle on both sides. These group of people, this is how they would be arranged. This is a Greek chorus. 
this is an illustration of a Greek chorus. So these people would, would be the ones singing. So it is a sung in a group, the Greek chorus, using not just the lyre, but multiple musical instruments and dancing as well. So you understand, like, you know, you have all, you see, it's like an amphitheater right there. And it's like a performance, right? So it's a spectacle for everybody watching. So it is also a source of amusement and entertainment, right? So they did their best. So this is how they would entertain the people of Greece. Now, you have to understand the evolution. Let's talk about the evolution. Now, you know, there was a time when women were not allowed to study. Then we went ahead and we got rights for us to study and basic property rights and all of that. Then after that, now there was also a time when we're not, we were not allowed to wear pants. Okay, we're not allowed to wear jeans and everything would be scandalous. Now we wear it, right? We, it's part of our day-to-day -day attires. So what I'm saying is nothing is static. Culture is always developing. Now you will understand that as we travel through the ages, right? This is something which I have written for you all to understand. As we travel through the ages, literature, like other things, evolved, changed and progressed along with civilization. Our literature also progressed with with us right as we move through time so lyric poetry evolved as well language evolved and the english language became particularly all-encompassing language also evolved see in the greek time they only wrote prose and they used why did they use the instrument you made to make it more entertaining to make it sound more uh, you know alluring to make it sound well so they maybe they thought that okay maybe if i use the uh, string instrument this verse this verse that i have written will sound better so they used to use this okay the string instrument they used to write these verses in in um how would i say in a song form to be sung they used to write these verses to be sung lyric poetry i'm talking about then as time passed and English language became all-encompassing, all-encompassing as in you know right that even today the Oxford English Dictionary every year adds new words to it. It Now you from the Indian English Dictionary also chai is a word, okay, that uh, to guard is a word that has been added to the uh, uh, Oxford English Dictionary. It encompasses, all-encompassing meaning it's absorbing everything from all other languages also. So, you know, English also progressed, you know, uh, we, we developed our language and by by the time we reached the Eliz Elizabethan era, you know, language actually developed significantly. And then we realized that, you know, language can be made rhythmical also. You don't need music to actually make language rhythmical. You can have language itself uh, serving the purpose of music, of rhythm, you know, of beats. So that is what exactly poetry is for us today. We know poetry today as this. That poetry should be rhyming, there should be a meter, there should be, you know, all of these. But in the Greek, ancient Greek time, you have to understand that language is also one thing, right? In ancient Greece, verses were composed for music, like uh, lyric poetry was composed to be sung. These were songs, okay, to be sung. And now we have language itself, which, you know, after development, after poetry's development also, by the time we reach the Elizabethan era, language itself um, was employed um, to be rhythmical, to sound rhythmical, okay? So... Uh, and we realized that words can be made to be musical too. These uh, this technique was explored widely in the Elizabethan era. Even drama used verbal melody. Verbal melody, if you read uh, Shakespeare, if you read, you know, the, to be or not to be. I mean, you can hear the melody there, right? This, this is verbal melody. You're not singing. You're not singing, but you're actually arranging the words in such a way that it gives a particular rhythm to it. To be or not to be. You know, the season of mists and mellow fruitfulness. You, so, you know, you could weave words into rhythm. And that's exactly what poetry is today for us. So, you know, this technique was explored widely in the Elizabethan era. Even drama used verbal melody. In drama, melody refers to the musical elements used to convey emotions and enhance storytelling. It can also include the rhythm of speech, which can help to establish mood, empathy and a sense of urgency. What is this sense of urgency? You tell me, okay, this mood enhanced storytelling. I have already discussed this literary devices, onomatopoeia. Okay, all of these kind of things, bees are buzzing, leaves are rustling. What is all of this? It is because you are actually enhancing your storytelling by using these, uh, these qualities. This is verbal melody and you use literary devices to give verbal melody to your words, uh, to your words or your sentences. So this is how language was developing. Now, now you see that uh, similarly as we progress further in time we see Keats and Shelley using this technique in the Romantic Age and then we use we see Tennyson exploring this in the Victorian era. So you understand lyric poetry has developed over time. It was not always about being songs. Of course 
this the today in modern times you know we say lyrics of a song okay it has its roots in that greek lyric now it we it has traveled through that the idea has traveled and it has evolved to what we know it as today so this is melic choric songs of ancient greece i have told you a little bit about the evolution this is what you have to know now we are going to talk about the actual thing lyric poetry as how we know it today lyric poetry in literature and the characteristics of lyric poetry which are important for us so let's go on to the next slide So let us have a look at modern day lyric poetry. So modern lyric poetry is a formal type of poetry which expresses personal emotions or feelings typically spoken in first person. So if you have a poem which actually uh, reveals your inner feelings, uh, that is lyric poetry. It talks about your personal feelings, it talks about what you are feeling inside, what you are thinking right now. It is very personal to the writer and when you express yourself that way it is lyric poetry. The term for both modern lyric poetry and modern song lyrics like I said derives from ancient Greek literature. The Greek lyric which was defined by its musical accompaniment usually on a stringed instrument known as the kithara, a seven stringed lyre. The the instrument is known as a lyre and that's why it's called lyric. So hence lyric. So lyric poetry like I said you have to remember that it it talks about your personal feelings it talks about uh, your emotions and that's why and typically it's um, spoken in first person now see you can have um, how will i say you can read a poetry you can read a poem and then you to- it's all about feelings and emotions and love there can be the theme of love in a poem but you know if it is not spoken in the first person will it be a lyric it's not it has to be spoken it is personal to you it's personal emotion or feeling spoken in the first person that is a lyric and we have to look at the characteristics if all of these characteristics you find in any poetry then that will identify as a lyric so the first thing is that it expresses your personal emotions and feelings the second is point of view what are the characteristics of a lyric poetry let's have a look point of view written from the first person point of view so whenever you read a poem no if you find these characteristics just stick it as lyric poetry so you have f- first person point of view the person is talking about their own personal feelings to you to the reader now length not a requirement but generally uh, rather short lyric poetry is actually uh, very short but it's not a requirement that it has to be short only lyric poems can also be long now simplistic often use simplistic language and is easier for a general reader to understand content the content is intimately connected to the poet's thoughts and private expression of their feelings more to the heart than the intellect uh, you know if you read a modern uh you know like ts eliot's poems and all it's a lot of intellect that you have to uh, use but again if you read tennyson and then you read uh, keats it's all about the heart actually so you have uh, you know it's more about the heart than the intellect musical use of rhyme rhythm sound devices like i said the lyric itself will give that musical tone to the poem and then you have passion emotional and therefore passionate us- usually sorry usually expresses a single emotion or feeling so it's a single emotion if you're sad about something if you're um if you are um say happy about something if you're talking about love you're in love with someone and you're writing a poem it typically is very passionate and intense in that expression and it talks about the single emotion and feeling throughout okay so this will be more clear when we talk about the types of lyric poetry because i think all of you have actually read and you have read the poems also you've read the definitions also you have come across the types of lyric poetry and i just want to remind you of them so let's go to the next slide and then we'll look at the characteristics of uh, lyric poetry as we analyze the types of lyric poetry okay so let's just move on to the last slide now the first type of lyric poetry is sonnets okay sonnet is a type of lyric poem okay and you think about if you've read shakespeare's sonnets okay if you've read shakespeare's sonnets then you know what they talk about right their structure can be different structure sonnets i mean sorry um, a lyric poetry can be of different kinds structure stanza arrangement can be different but you see the characteristics okay Shakespeare and sonnets 14 lines very a uh, very short sonnets are very short right so that you come from uh, about the length point of view first person point of view Shakespeare is talking to us the poet is talking to us if you read the sonnets okay then you talk about simplistic they're easy to understand when you read Shakespeare and sonnets you'll easily understand them because of the language now you talk about the content they're intimately connected to his feelings if you uh, uh, if you 
talk about Shakespeare's sonnets and his treatment of love in those sonnets, then you'll understand, and his love interest also, you will understand that they are very uh, intimately connected with the writer, and it's very personal. When you read, you'll feel that one-to-one -one connection. Okay, then you have musical. Of course, the way he has arranged the meter, the way he has arranged the syllable and everything, okay, all of those arrangements, all of the techniques that he has um, uh, used and the devices that he has employed actually gives that musical quality when you read his poems. So, um, that is one. And last is passion. Like I said, that emotional, that emotion and that passion will shine through when you read Shakespeare and sonnets. In fact, any sonnet for that matter. So, the first type of lyric poetry is sonnet. You have to qualify, right? You have to tick mark that, okay, this is a lyric poem and sonnets qualify because they actually tick mark all the points okay they validate all the points so sonnet is a type of lyric poem that is usually written in iambic pentameter and contains 14 lines typically revolve around the idea of love so this is first another one is elegy so I'm pretty sure you've read elegies, okay, elegy written to a country churchyard, all of those things okay I'm pretty sure that you've come across elegies classically have four lines Classically, that is traditionally, they have just four lines. Now it's not necessary. Elegies can be longer now, but usually they were written in four lines only with an AB, AB rhyme scheme and typically written in iambic pentameter. Again, written as a lament in response to the death of someone. To the death of someone, it's personal. You're talking about your feelings. It's short, right? Four lines. And then you're talking about the first person point of view. You are writing it. First, pers uh, first person, the, when the reader reads, it's as if the poet is speaking to you. And then you have, uh, you know, it's a uh, simplistic language, of course. Content, again, it's very personal to the person who's writing. You're talking about the death of someone. Or when you're addressing death, it's a very personal thing, right? It's a very, very personal thing. So you have to see everything is uh, a tick mark again. Elegies are also lyric poetry. Haikus. Haikus is a Japanese, I mean, I wanted to include this because it's pretty interesting. Uh, you know, the uh, haikus were actually part of longer poems. They were the introduction of longer poems. Haikus were the, say, for example, I'm just giving an example. The first four lines, just giving an example, okay? First four lines of a long poem, okay? So, they were the introduction of a long poem, okay? And they just extracted that part. They also hold a lot of meanings and those are haikus, very short, short poems, okay? A Japanese poetic form that consists of three lines with five syllables in the first line, seven in the second and five in the third, 17 total syllables. Now, we'll just count together. This is an uh, example of a haiku. Just look at the three lines. So, Imagine there's a long poem and the first three lines of the poem you extracted, that's a haiku. So haiku also hold a lot of meaning. Now, they say that there are 17 syllables that in total. The first line has five syllables. So let's just count together. Brown leaf dry quivers, five, okay? The second line has seven syllables. So a sudden gust branches snop. So you, a snap, sorry, he snaps. So this is seven. Now you have uh, the, the five in the third. There are five syllables in the third. So you have beauty in dying. So you see five syllables. So haikus are like this. This is again type of lyric poetry. You see brown leaf dry quivers. Uh, a sudden gust branches snap beauty in dying. So you're talking about death. You're talking about something. Uh, the emotions are coming out. Okay. Of you. This, this is all. All of this. You have sonnets, elegies, haikus, type of lyric poetry. You have the, the syllables that add that musical tone again. And it's again personal. Now you have ode. Ode also. Ode to autumn. You know, you've heard all of these things you have uh, come across. And this is also part of lyric poetry. What I'm trying to say is even I was not aware before uh, when I was doing my graduation. I was also not aware that, you know, these are all parts of lyric poetry. I was pretty confused. And then later when I started studying, then I realized that, okay, so lyric poetry has its branches as well. There are types of lyric poetry and all of these fit into it. So you have ode. The word ode comes from the Greek word um, adian, which means to sing or to chant. Okay. Now, odes are serious, reflective and elaborately structured poems uh, praising or glorifying an event or individual describing nature intellectually as well as emotionally. So, you know, all of these uh, different types of lyric poetry actually have different impacts on the reader. Sonnets, when you read sonnets, will have a different impact on you. Elegies, when you read uh, elegies, will have a different emotional impact on you. Haikus, when you read, they'll have a different altogether impact on you because of their short crispness and their on-the-point uh, uh, 
topics and also because of their personal attachment and the beauty with which they write these three lines okay and ode is one of my favorites uh, ode is very very um, uh, reflective it's very very personal and elaborately explained so one of my favorite is ode to autumn as always so ode to autumn by john keats i have just included it here for example season of mists and mellow fruitfulness close bosom friend of the maturing sun conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run so so basically he's talking about autumn and you know um, he's he's actually let his feelings flow about autumn about autumn his feelings his thinking his thoughts the way he sees autumn and the impact that autumn has on him so these are reflective and elaborately structured poems okay and it they talk uh, about they glorify a particular thing talk about a particular person or a particular here in this case he's talking about a particular season which is autumn right so describing nature intellectually as well as emotionally so i hope that this is clear this is actually the last slide so i'll just recap very quickly in the in, in ancient greece we have um the greek lyric which was written in um, uh, the dialects of ancient greece it was part of the classical era and this lyric ancient greek lyric could be divided into melic and choric uh, uh, songs melic songs were usually sung um, you know um, uh, with um, alone i mean they were sung as a soloist the soloist would sing them and uh, choric songs would have chorus okay the chorus singing them now melic and choric songs were both uh, singing songs in the verse form right and with time it developed it actually um, okay so also the uh, music musical instrument that would be employed in singing these songs would be the lyre or the olos okay the the reed pipe so what happened the or the reed flute or the pipe that and the olos and the kithara the lyre right so this these are the two musical instruments that would be employed language developed we progressed through time literature developed and then we uh, came across uh, lyric poetry which actually talked about which actually figured out that language could also be made useful and a language could also be made uh, rhythmical and musical and that's exactly what happened in the uh, elizabethan era that's where they used this technique extensively and then as we progressed through time uh, we actually used this uh, technique more and more where language especially the english language became all encompassing and more rich and then we started using language itself to add verbal melody to drama and melody or rhythm uh, or um, add this musical uh, tone to the words itself um, in uh, poetry so we're talking about the types of lyric poetry lyric poetry in modern times we know it as expression of personal feelings and emotions it's uh, spoken in first person and some there are many other types of lyric poetry but the major types of lyric poetry are sonnets elegies haikus and odes so i hope that this is clear this is more or less lyric poetry and horace was one of the very uh, good uh, uh, you know proponents or the very good composer of lyric poems and we're going to do that when we're going to begin with the roman critics uh, discussing the roman critics as part of our literary criticism uh, portion and that is it for today i hope that you have understood this uh, video i hope that it has been clear for you if this video has been helpful for you then please don't forget to like the video share the video and subscribe to my channel for similar content and if you're all about literature then this is the place to be until we meet again i really hope that you stay healthy and happy. See you in the next one, guys.